Hello and a very good evening to you all. Welcome to this Mythical Ireland video. My name is Anthony Murphy. Now I know for a fact that the ancient Irish were great storytellers. I wonder, uh, and I have done through my work, just to what extent uh, those stories may have contained information pertaining to the movements of the heavens. And of course, that has been a very uh, dominant theme uh, throughout my written work. And probably most famous of all in that regard is my first book, uh, Island of the Setting Sun, In Search of Ireland's Ancient Astronomers, which I wrote with Richard Moore in, published in 2006. And the premise of that book was that, you know, as Richard had said to me when we were first introduced 20 years ago in January of 1999, there's a lot more astronomy going on out there at those monuments than, you know, the official record is leading us to believe. And of course, one of the pathways into the exploration of ancient astronomy relating to the Brunabonia monuments of Newgrange, Nowth and Douth, and of course, other monuments like Fornox, like the Loch Crew Complex, etc. Uh, was through the mythology. Uh, our, we would believe that a certain amount of astronomical, cosmological, uh, astrological information is encoded in Irish myth. Anyway, tonight I want to talk briefly about this wonderful book, and this book is called Hamlet's Mill, an essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth, which sounds very general, but this is more specifically focused on the idea of astronomical information being contained in the myths. It was first published in 1969. This is a paperback edition from 1977. The authors, oh, please forgive me, uh, Giorgio di Santiana, now that's S-A-N-T-I-L-L-A-N-A, -L -L -A -A, and Hertha von Dechend, which I reckon is probably German, but forgive me if it's not. So I bought this probably around Actually, I probably have the date of purchase in it, June 2003. At that time, while doing research for Island of the Setting Sun, I was told by several friends, researchers, colleagues that uh, this is a book that I must read if I was interested in the area of ancient astronomy. I wanted to talk briefly about the chapter, uh, A Guide for the Perplexed. And so I think what's happening here and the attempt upon on the behalf of the authors here is to try and break down a little bit some of the astronomical concepts. And one of the great difficulties with this hypothesis, and indeed one of the great difficulties with the hypothesis contained within the covers of Island of the Setting Sun, is that there is a certain level of astronomical, I suppose, expertise, um, experience, um, you know, particularly relating to the movements of the sky that is needed in order to even have a basic understanding of the concepts. And one of the great difficulties is trying to bridge that knowledge gap with regard to those who are engaged in modern times in the study of monuments and mythology. Uh, namely archaeologists and anthropologists and those who are experts in uh, myth, folklore, ethnography, um, philology, etc, etc. Uh, and in the beginning of this chapter, the authors admit freely that the book is highly unconventional. Uh, there is a, I've seen complaints that it's badly edited, so a huge portion of the back of the book is contains the appendices. Um, there are, I don't know how many, there's lots and lots of uh, appendices. To begin with, there is no system that can be presented in modern analytical terms. There is no key and there are no principles from which a presentation can be deduced. The structure comes from a time when there was no such thing as a system in our sense, and it would be unfair to search for one there could hardly have been one among people who committed all their ideas to memory. And of course, remember, the persistence of myth is that very complex stories, including, for instance, Toynbo Kulnga, the cattle raid of Cooley, were told across successive generations over long periods of time, 
entirely from memory. So I suppose the, the main concern of this chapter, and indeed I think of Hamlet's Mill overall, is with what could be considered to be the greatest or one of the greatest cycles of time uh, or cycles of cosmology, and that is precession of the equinoxes. And so a couple of very basic concepts. The, the Earth's equatorial plane is, so if you could sort of imagine that there's a disk in the Earth splitting the northern and southern hemispheres at the equator, and you could follow that disk out into space. Well, that disk is inclined to the ecliptic, and the ecliptic is the path of the sun uh, and the planets, and generally speaking, the moon, although the moon's own path is slightly inclined to the ecliptic. And that uh, time, uh, precession of the equinoxes is uh, the result of a very, very slow wobble of the Earth. So again, if you can imagine the Earth is like a spinning top and from the North Pole and from the South Pole are extended, you know, uh, basically long poles or sticks or, I suppose, uh, pointers. Well, what happens is that they wobble very, very slowly over a period of almost 26,000 years, 25,920 years. One of the results of this is that the pole star is changing. So for instance, in the Neolithic, the pole star was Alpha Draconis, which is the star Thuban in the constellation of Draco, the dragon. At the time of the Greeks, it was Beta Ursa Minoris, and of course, that's the small bear. And for the time being, it is in Alpha Ursa, it is Alpha Ursa Minoris, which is the star we know as Polaris which, or Polaris if you want, which marks the northern pole of the sky. Now, in addition to this, the, the four major hanging points of the year, well, there's, there are two major hanging points and, and two sort of lesser hanging points. The hanging points are the solstices and then the lesser ones dividing the year um, between the solstices are the equinoxes. Sorry, I'm just looking for my bookmark so I can bookmark that page. And so those four points in the sky, so if you can imagine that the sun is traveling an imaginary line through the zodiac, and that's where we get Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius, from Aries, uh, Aquarius, Pisces, um, is the sun's path through these constellations of the sky. So if you can imagine uh, the the age that we are currently in is the age of Pisces, and that's because the sun's vernal point, the position of the sun at the spring equinox, is in Pisces. Previously, it was in um, Aries. Previous to that, it was in Taurus. And previous to that, it was in Gemini. Now, the sun's path, the sun's precession through the um, zodiac is counter to its regular movement. Uh, which is, um, you know, from season to season, which is through the zodiac in in the proper order. So, you know, um, you can see why it's easy to get bogged down in the astronomy. And uh, the zodiacal band is what's described here. And that's because, you know, of the fluctuate, especially with regard to the moon the way the moon's path is slightly inclined to the sun's path. So if you watch the moon over a period of 19 years, a uh, matonic cycle, or actually a, a, a period of 18.6 years, the rotation of the nodes, you'll see that in fact, over that period of time, it if you were to plot out its position every night uh, for those whole 19 years, you would see that it forms a band rather than following a single uh, line along the ecliptic. And since the constellations rule the four corners of the quadrangular Earth only temporarily, such an Earth can, said, can rightly be said to perish, and a new Earth to rise from the waters with four new constellations rising at the four points of the year. Now this is something I discussed in Island of the Setting Sun. The idea that new eras in terms of Earth history were marked out by the Sun's movement from one sign into the other. The amount of time that the sun spends in each sign on this processional journey through the zodiac 
is, I, I'm just trying to find the figure, it's around 2,100 or 2,200 years. I'll probably find it when I'm not looking for it. So uh, as I said at the moment, we the sun is in the constellation of Pisces, but very soon it will be in the constellation of Aquarius, hence the age of Aquarius. And I think that phrase was first introduced by the uh, psychotherapist C.G. Young. At time zero, the two equinoctial hinges of the world had been Gemini and Sagittarius, spanning between them the arch of the Milky Way. Now, this has been a very important element of uh, my work, especially again in Island of the Setting Sun. So first of all, the idea that the changes were, the changes, major changes happened when certain things were happening in the sky. For instance, when the Milesians landed, uh, to take Ireland from the Tuatha de Danann, a, a feat. Remember, these are mortals um, coming to defeat the immortals, and that's a task they were successful in. Well, when they arrived, and Amorgin or Aurgin, the uh, the poet, uh, the spiritual figurehead of the Milesians, is the first to land. After they successfully endured the sea tempest, the storm that had been concocted for them by the Tuatha de Danann. Well, according to the annals, the date of their arrival was Bialtana in the year 1694 BC. Now, if you go back with the astronomy software, what you'll see on that day is that the sun is between Gemini and Taurus. It's between the feet of Gemini and the horns of Taurus, the bull. And it's actually above the constellation Orion, but it's in the Milky Way. And I thought that was a very significant astro-cosmological moment because Aurigin, who is a poet, also an astronomer, declares what land is better than this island of the setting sun? Who but I knows the place where the sun sets? Who but I knows the ages of the moon? So this uh, figure, prominent figure of mythology, who I say, as I say, leads the successful expedition to overcome the Tuatha de Danann is an astronomer and a poet. And as he arrives, the sun is in Orion. But not only that, as he chants these words, he's standing on the shore of the Boyne River, whose name is Awen Bofinna, the river of the white cow. And don't forget, as I've written in several of my books, that one of the old names for the Milky Way in Irish was Balach na Bofinna, the way of the white cow, or Bohar na Bofinna, the road of the white cow. Essentially, uh, the Milky Way and the Boyne are seen as equivalents. The Milky Way, the celestial version, and the Boyne, the terrestrial version. So that was all very fascinating. But equally fascinating is the fact that the sun's path only crosses the Milky Way in two locations, one of which is in the gap between Sagittarius and Scorpius, and one in the gap between Gemini and Taurus. And this is very interesting. This is something that even the scholars actually seem to miss is the fact that there is, a, as it were, there are two extra zodiac constellations. If you were to consider Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, there are all sorts of interesting um, facets to that story pertaining to Irish myth, particularly St. Patrick. Uh, uh, so uh, I highly recommend reading uh, the section of Island of the Setting Sun dealing with the high man and St. Patrick, and also St. Patrick's equinox journey on mythicalireland.com. Uh, and the other one being Orion, because essentially what Orion does is he's holding his hand up over his head, almost as if this warrior-like, god-like, um, hero-like figure is controlling the movements of the sun, the moon and the planets along the ecliptic. In a sense, that's the sort of thing that I discussed. The task then was to recover from the remote past an utterly lost science linked to an equally lost culture, one in which anthropologists have only seen illiterate, primitive man. It was as if the legendary Cathedral Angluti emerged from the depth of prehistory with its bells still ringing. And I'm sorry that I don't know what that cathedral is, but anyway, I'm sure one of you will be able to tell me. The Greek astronomers had enough instrumentation and data to detect the motion, which is immensely slow. The sun moves along the sun's vernal point. It's, it, it's, it's 
I'm trying to describe this in terms that everybody can understand. Its equinox and solstice points are slowly regressing through the zodiac at a rate of 70, one degree every 72 years, which is approximately two sun widths every 72 years. It's barely perceptible in somebody's lifetime. But he says that the Greek astronomers saw, you know, had had detected the, the, the motion. Hipparchus in 127 BC called it the precession of the equinoxes. And there is good reason to assume that he actually discovered this, that it had been known some thousand years previously. And of course, if you've again read Island of the Setting Sun, you'll be familiar with the calendar stone at Nauth, which appears to contain calculations of a subunit of the Metonic cycle. And, you know, if we are on to, you know, discoveries, uh, the Metonic cycle was apparently discovered by a Greek called Meton in the 5th century BC, but uh, depictions of it are apparently, and if that's what you believe they are, inscribed into stone um, 3 thousand maybe three thousand three hundred bc so twenty seven hundred years before meton ever existed so what's to say that precession of the equinoxes wasn't something that was known by prehistoric cultures for thousands of years modern archaeological scholars have been singularly obtuse about the idea because they have cultivated a pristine ignorance of astronomical thought some of them actually ignorant of the precession itself and the reason uh, I even bring that up, um, and, and it's something that I've discussed on occasion and something I have to be very careful about discussing. But nonetheless, it's important to point out that uh, archaeological scholars in modern Ireland, by and large, the vast majority of them have little or no working knowledge of the movements of the sky. Do they need to know these things? Well, in my opinion, if they're dealing with prehistoric structures and the excavation thereof, they should do. Otherwise, they cannot hold a premium on the interpretation of those sites. And so the verdict pertaining to the knowledge of the ancients in relation to complex movements of the sky, such as the rotation of the lunar nodes, such as the prediction of eclipses, such as the metonic cycle, and of course, precession of the equinoxes, uh, is down to the individual scholars and whether they think that the prehistoric people involved in the construction of the various structures uh, could possibly have had this knowledge. And so it becomes a sort of subjective overview. The comparison of the views just quoted with those upheld by the majority of modern scholars shows that one's own subjective opinions about what is easy and what is difficult might not be the most secure basis for a serious historiography of science. And so in relation to that, as Hans Ludendorff once pointed out, it is an unsound, an unsound approach to Maya astronomy to start from preconceived convictions about what the Maya could have known and what they could not possibly have known. One should instead draw conclusions only from the data as given in the inscriptions and codices. Now, the difficulty relating to Irish megalithic sites and Irish mythology is, first of all, um, the megalithic art contained on the stones of a lot of megalithic sites is not a language as such. It is symbolic. The experts say it's entirely non-representational. I disagree with that. The mythology you cannot prove one way or the other is descended from the builders of the monuments. You can suggest and you can make a, um, a you can build a, a circumstantial case uh, in favor of that. But what you can't do is you can't say the myths that we have inherited uh, across the mists of time definitely go back that far. You can only suggest it. The space-time continuum does not affect precession. It is by now only a boring complication. It has lost relevance for our affairs, whereas once it was the only majestic secular motion that our ancestors could keep in mind when they looked for a great cycle which could affect humanity as a whole. And that's an important thing again, the idea of great changes in the sky introducing uh, very dramatic changes on the earth, such as the taking over of Ireland. Uh, by the mortals from the gods.
they believed that the sliding of the sun along the equinoctial point affected the frame of the cosmos and determined a succession of world ages under different zodiacal signs. And yet, were history really understood in this admittedly flat sense of things happening one after the other? This is in relation to the, you know, the view of history being just a series of events that happen, one, one following the other. We should be better off than we are now when we, are all, when we almost dare not admit the assumption from which this book starts that our ancestors of the high and far off times were endowed with minds wholly comparable to ours and were capable of rational processes, always given the means at hand. In other words, they were the same as us in terms of, um, you know, their, their uh, cognitive mental functions and abilities. Um, they may not have ha had access to the technology that we have today by which we can measure distances to stars and we can send spacecraft out and measure the atmospheres or lack thereof on the planets of the solar system. Some words have still to be said about the problem that is at the very root of many misunderstandings, that of translation. And I think this is relevant perhaps to an extent to the Irish mythology. Most of the texts were written, if they were ever orig originally written, in remote and half obliterated languages from the far past. The task of translation has been taken over by a guild of dedicated, highly specialised philologists who have had to reconstruct the dictionaries and grammars of these languages. And of course, one of the things in relation to that is that errors can enter into the translation, uh, you know, arising from preconceptions uh, or prejudices, etc., etc. And if, again, you're translating, uh, for instance, an ancient Irish text, when I've looked at a lot of Irish myths and I've said that could be astronomical, that could be relating to the sun, that could be relating to a movement of the moon, that could be relating to an eclipse, that could be pertaining, for instance, in the case of uh, Angus and Kerr, uh, to the swan constellation Cygnus and the concerns uh, apparent, ap that are apparent in the design of Newgrange with that cross-shaped constellation. And so if you haven't got that astronomical knowledge to start out with and you don't have, well I suppose that's a prejudice in a way, but if you don't have that uh, within your purview then you're not going to see the possibilities in terms of uh, astronomy uh, or even cosmology because in that regard, um, I'm inclined to view, for instance, the Isle Namiran, the Stone of Divisions at Ishnok, as being a sort of axis mundi. Uh, and there was a stone at the top of Newgrange, and I've explored this in my latest book, Mythical Ireland. Um, there was a stone on the top of Newgrange uh, in mythology referred to as Lech Ben, upon which the monster, the Mata, was slain. And I wonder whether, first of all, that that wasn't an Axis Mundi, but with a correspondence, as I said earlier, like the stick pointing up out of the sky, um, that perhaps, you know, there were localised Axis Mundi. Like the real axis is the poles, or are the, the real axes. The real axis cuts through the earth. Uh, from North Pole to South Pole, but a localized axis mundi, uh, where it, it, it as it were, uh, a, a centering aspect, a unifying and centering aspect of the the telluric uh, uh, earth, the you know the the earth in which you dwell. Uh, and in, in that regard, the Stone of Divisions is not so much a Stone of Divisions as a Stone of Unification because it is where the four ancient provinces of Ireland meet, uh, Ulster, Leinster, Munster and Connacht. Uh, but the, the stone itself is considered the fifth magical province or Meath, uh, as uh, Midge or Meadje to give it its old Irish name. And that was seen as the, the, the fifth province, but it was actually just, well, not just a stone, uh, a glacial erratic um weighing something like oh i don't know uh, is it 25 tons or something like that and so modern translators believe so firmly in their own invention according to which the underworld has to be looked for in the interior of our globe instead of in the sky because in the egyptian dictionary for instance the simple word heaven the english word heaven has 37 terms whose nuances are left to the translator and used according to his lights. In the case of um, the underworld, I think that's what he's saying here, 
that or the sorry they the authors that even 370 specific astronomical terms could not cause them to stumble uh, and so for instance if you look in the old folklore the old irish dictionaries you'll find that there are lots of different words for the moon there are lots there are several different words for stars um, there are lots of different concepts i mean there's actually a page about the moon uh, various descriptions of the moon you know such as you know there's a halo around the moon there's a ring around the moon tonight that sort of thing the waning moon uh, i discussed in island of the setting sun uh, was seen as the wounding of the moon which is very interesting pertaining to some of the myths particularly about bowen and how she is wounded as she comes away from the well of segish and so in terms of island of the setting sun uh so the thesis as i say overall was the idea that uh the megalithic monuments um the design of them and the orientation of them and the alignment of them uh, had astronomical concerns and the, mytholo the mythology pertaining to the individual sites and sometimes collective sites could be uh, it, it, it is suggested could have been uh, interpreted astronomically and so for instance there's a story in the Dinshenicus uh, pertaining to Bowen about how Dagda who is very definitely a, a solar deity uh, enters the house of Elkmar which is Newgrange uh, in order to to lie with Bowen uh, in order to make love with Bowen who is Elkmar's wife and that this happens when the sun is standing still in the sky and it's no surprise to me that Bruna Bonia, you know when we think of uh, you know the old name for Newgrange and the complex in general Bruna Bonia, uh, is translated as the palace on the Boyne. The problem with that is that people forget that Bowen was actually a deity first and foremost. The river was named after the deity. So in effect, we should be looking at Brug na Bo Boyne as in the palace of Bowen. But of course, further to that, in the chapter, uh, I think it's chapter eight of, it is indeed, chapter eight of Island of the Setting Sun is called, for very good reason, Newgrange, the womb of the moon, or even more specifically, the womb of Bowen. Uh, that that effectively was um, uh, an astronomical event, namely the winter solstice illumination of the interior of Newgrange, um, dressed up in the language of myth. Similarly, at Douth, there's a story about how the king commanded all the men of Ireland to build him a tower from which he could pass to heaven, and he commanded his sister to make the sun stand still in the heavens. Uh, so that there would be endless day and this is undoubtedly a, a, a summer solstice myth uh, relating to that time of the year when the sun is standing still it's rising and setting positions are standing still in the northeast and the northwest and that the sun doesn't uh, dip far enough beneath the horizon for astronomical twilight to end thus giving you the eternal day that's required for the task and in order to prove this uh, myself and Richard Moore spent uh, a couple of midsummers at Douth uh, and that's taken at midnight on midsummer at Douth, showing you that the twilight is actually endless and that there's enough light uh, to see your way in the dark. You know, in terms of uh, Amergin, I've suggested that, you know, this uh, sun, the sun being in Orion, was a very significant thing because it was as if uh, man, in the form of the constellation, uh, was taking control of things and the, the the cosmology was seen to have been very very symbolic significantly symbolic in much the same way as the story of Douth uh, about Bressel uh, Bodibad which means lacking in cattle uh, suggests that the monument of Douth was built uh, at a time when there was a cattle disease and there was nothing no cattle left except for one bull and seven cows and I've suggested that this in fact is a reference to the constellation Taurus and indeed to that time in prehistory when the Pleiades were rising uh, just before dawn but would have been swamped in the coming or growing light uh, of dawn we call that a heliacal rising and the reason heliacal risings are important and that's a feature that's discussed at length in um, Hamlet's Mill uh, the reason that's important is because a heliacal rising shows you the position of the sun in the zodiac or at least it confirms it as if you didn't know it already I mean for instance a lot of people don't know some of the very basic concepts of astronomy uh, pertaining to lunar astronomy so for instance when you see the full moon 
it's directly opposite in the sky to where the sun is. Um, so it's also directly opposite in terms of constellations of the zodiac. So it's six constellations of the zodiac ahead of the sun or six constellations behind, whatever way you want to uh, describe it. And so if you look at the full moon uh, in its month, you can, you can then uh, work out uh, where the sun is. But heliacal rising also gives you that opportunity to actually see the constellation rising, uh, the one immediately uh, after where the sun's position is. In other words, if you see the Pleiades rising and then they get swamped in the, in the growing light of dawn, then the sun is probably in Taurus or it may well be in that magical position in the hand of Orion in the Milky Way in the heavenly Boyne River um, just before it rises. And that was something, the vernal equinox sun in Taurus was something that happened in the early earlier part of the Neolithic. I think that sets the frame, uh, the time frame uh, of not just the myth, but the monument. And of course, the myth was written down in medieval times, uh, as most Irish myths were, and uh, all bets are off as to how old the, those uh, those myths, especially the Dunchanicus, the ones that appear to describe how significant places and monuments came into being. Uh, nobody's willing to say one way or the other. Yes, these are definitely, you know, I mean, there are plenty of scholars willing to say the myths are older than the time they were written down. But of course, uh, we know that from world mythology that a lot of myths were transmitted for, for successive generations over hundreds of years and sometimes thousands of years uh, uninterrupted. Witzel, who has written a, a very large history of world mythology, has suggested that one myth about the... Uh, the destruction of the dragon or the monster and the dismemberment thereof, uh, which is a feature of Boyne Valley mythology in the story of the Mata, is in fact 20,000 years old, which would make it, uh, you know, an, uh, well, in this part of the world would make it an Ice Age myth. Uh, I think that Cygnus is particularly important in the Boyne Valley because at the time the Boyne monuments were built, uh, Cygnus was doing something that, that it only does for about 100 or 200 years during the entire 26,000 year uh, cycle of procession of the equinoxes and that was that it skimmed the horizon the, the, the main star, the tail star of, of Cygnus which we call Deneb uh, Deneb is an Arabic name meaning the tail of the hen that Deneb was actually setting briefly in the north uh, before rising again because at all other times during the 26,000 year cycle of precession of the equinoxes uh, Cygnus is circumpolar, Deneb is circumpolar uh, from this latitude that means that it, it is never uh, dying, un undying, uh, land of the ever living ones it's, it forms a circle in the sky during the night and it's high up in the sky and then it dips down but at no time does it actually disappear on us except of course during daylight hours but for the whole of the year it's visible and then for this brief period of time it was disappearing and the fact that uh, Fornox points to the rising place of Deneb I think is significant in that regard. Anyway there's lots to explore. Um, Island of the Setting Sun unfortunately is out of print. Uh, there is a, a version for Amazon Kindle available on Amazon if you search for that. Um, if you have a colour, I, I don't, I think it works only on, on like iPads and certain colour versions of the Kindle. Uh, but anyway, it's, it is exactly as it was printed with all the colour images. It's not just text. It's, it's a, a fully readable browser. But it's almost like a PDF, you know. And again, just to go back to the, the book that started the conversation, which is Hamlet's Mill. Um, I definitely uh, would be inclined to concur with a lot of the statements that are contained in this book. Um, you may have your own opinion about that and uh, when you get an opportunity to read it uh, you, you, you may not uh, uh, fully concur with some of the conclusions reached in it. Certainly it is uh, thought provoking and uh, I do think that the authors say that in the book that you know it's, it's not always about reaching definitive conclusions but it's sometimes it's about making a good case and I think there's a very good case to be made here in Ireland that the people who built the ancient monuments of the Boyne Valley and some of the other megalithic uh, passage tombs or she on the hilltops in various parts of the country were very uh, adept astronomers not just with regard to the annual movement of the sun and the seasons 
but also with regard to the seemingly complex movements of the moon, which are only seemingly complex to the modern mind that refuses to study them, and uh, some of the planets, and of course, uh, that greatest of all of the cycles, precession of the equinoxes. If you've enjoyed this video, you can see a lot more content by visiting my website, which is mythicalireland.com. If you're on Facebook, you can follow me, facebook.com forward slash mythical Ireland. Uh, uh, again, on Twitter, it's mythical Ireland. Instagram, it's mythical Ireland. If you would like to support what I do, I have a Patreon page. You can become a patron of Mythical Ireland uh, for a small outlay each month. Uh, there are various uh, rewards, and one of the rewards um, for certain levels is early and exclusive access to photographs, announcements, podcasts, and videos like this one. So I hope you've enjoyed this chat and uh, there'll, be, there'll be a lot more where this came from, hopefully in the future. But don't forget, in the meantime, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the Mythical Ireland channel here on YouTube. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Sláinte.